with you, teachers. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, and I can't wait to see you all after these almost two years without meeting teachers like face to face. Uh, I really want to, to meet you again. So uh, I can see some hellos here. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you are already chatting because I need your participation so that it can be as interactive as possible. Uh, the idea today is to talk about grammar for teachers and language awareness and why this is important. Yes, yeah, so uh, one minute, I'll share my screen. Just a second, please. Can you see my screen? Can you just let me know if you can see my screen? Perfect. Uh, let's see what it is. Hi, so there is somebody from Ecuador, so welcome. The idea is to talk a little bit about grammar. Why is that? Because we teachers, we, we kind of uh, think grammar is important. We like grammar, uh, but sometimes it's difficult for us to know how much and what to share with students. Uh, so you cannot see my screen yet, so just a second. I'll share this again. Thanks for letting me know. Can you see my screen now? It's a yellow screen. Yes, okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, now let's go on. So to start with uh, this webinar on grammar, I would like to know, uh, I would like to share with you some of the grammar metaphors. Uh, what do people say uh, in relation to grammar? So they say that grammar is like a glue that holds language together. Uh, why is that? Because you have parts of the language and then grammar will put them together. It's an engine that drives language, is the map of the language, is the how, highway code of language. So those are all, uh, those are metaphors that we use when we are talking about grammar. And then you can decide on your favorite one. Have you ever used uh, any of those metaphors to refer to grammar? And then if I ask you, those are some metaphors, but what is grammar? How would you, how would you define it? Set of rules, okay. Eliane has never used, but she likes the first one. A structure of the language, okay. Two people wrote exactly the same thing, what else? Okay, very good definition by Eduardo. All right, so I mean, that terrifies the students. <laughs> That's interesting too. If you get the dictionary, this is the definition. So, uh, the rules by which words change their forms and are combined into sentences, or they study or use of these rules. So, basically speaking, the long one dictionary would define grammar as rules, uh, and then uh, it's a combination uh, of those, because there will be the change of forms and they will be combined into sentences, and then it's going to be about the study or use. That's basically what uh, grammar does. Basically, that's what grammar does. And then uh, somebody wrote that students uh, are afraid of, I think it was Tiago, yes? Tiago said, okay, something that students are terrified about. Uh, why do you think students don't like grammar? Do, do your students like grammar? Uh, 
Okay, difficult, boring because of the rules. So the definition involves many rules. So mostly because of the rules, okay. Because they have to memorize something because of mistakes. No one likes <laughs> an assess. I like grammar, come on. <laughs> there are some people who might like. Okay, because of the experience they had at school. Because teachers make uh, it too hard for them. Yes, all right, that could be a reason. Okay, I can see Albin and Elsie here, all right. Okay, okay. So those could be some of the reasons. And then, as teachers, how much grammar are we supposed to know? What do you think? So uh, basically speaking, everybody agrees that we should know a lot of grammar or at least enough to get around, enough to communicate, I think, in case of students, but as teachers. Okay. More than our students, uh, we should continue studying. All right. So everybody agrees. Now, I'd like to propose a, a self-evaluation. You don't need to share your answers now, but I'd like you to to reflect on those questions. So take your time to read those four questions and check if the answer would be yes or no, okay? All right, so you don't really need to share your answers, but some, some of you are sharing. Uh, and then, what could you do to overcome those things? Do you have any idea of what, what we could do in order to overcome those things? Simplify it, okay. By giving examples first, what else? Gamify, study, scaffold, okay, to be as clear as possible, to learn different ways to teach grammar. All right, there are many nice ideas. And I would say that the key uh, to try to not to answer yes to all those questions anymore, of course, uh, we're going to, to answer yes to some of them and sometimes, but uh, the answer, the key to that would be language awareness so uh, the way you're going to teach students is something so we could show examples first we should uh, try to be more objective and everything but in order to do that we need to know grammar uh, but not knowing how to use because oftentimes we learn how to use grammar but we need to know more than that more than how to use uh, we need to know more than the grammar rule because we need to know why things are the way they are, even if you're not sharing this with our students. So this is something interesting for us to think about. Sometimes I know lots of things. If I share everything I know, students will be confused, and that's not the idea. We want uh, to be, we want uh, to simplify things. We don't want to uh, make students confused. However, uh, when we know somebody mentioned this, we get more prepared for the questions they might ask and everything. So we should be aware of what is behind. We cannot only talk about like, oh, I know how to use the language, so that's enough. So we should know more than how to use. We should try to understand why uh, things are the way they are. Uh, so this is language awareness. And it should, it, it's like the key for you to start answering no to the to the questions from my uh, previous slide. 
And then in terms of language awareness, I've selected some of uh, some some of the things that I have seen when I observed lessons and some of inter some interesting examples from some uh, books that we work with grammar awareness. And now we are going to discuss uh, if things are correct, if they're incorrect, and we are going to talk a little bit about why they are correct or incorrect. So now I need you to participate, okay? So uh, my first uh, case here. So let's see how aware uh, we are in terms of language, okay? So this is the first example here. There are three sentences. I would like to know if they are all the three correct, all the three incorrect, or which one is correct or incorrect? Please answer. All right, so answers vary here. Uh, there are many people who think that the three of them are correct or the three of them are incorrect or some of them are correct or incorrect, especially number two. Uh, number two seems to be incorrect. Why is that? Because what is the general rule for any that we usually uh, see when we are teaching or we usually share with our students? Because uh, with any, we, we should, should be like a negative sentence, yes? Uh, however, or questions are negative, yes. Yeah. Exactly. This is the common rule that we share with our students. Uh, however, the three of them are correct. Uh, let's check why. It's possible to say, I like any pop music. What does it mean? If I say, I like any pop music. It means that Just a second, please. Uh, something happened here. I'm trying to share my screen again. Okay, I guess now we are back. Is everything okay again? Yes, I guess so. It's getting there. Can you see my screen now?
I guess it's loading. Okay, so I guess it's back now. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so when uh, we, we are mentioning about I like any pop music and somebody says, oh, uh, it's any kind of pop music or something like this. So uh, that's why the three of them are correct. So if we think of the white ball here is all the pop music in the world, okay? If I say I like some means that I like some but not all the pop music in the world. If I say that I like any, means that I like any, without any distinction, all right? And if I say I don't like any, it means the opposite, is that I don't like pop music at all. The same way that I can use some uh, in interrogative. I don't like some pop music, but I like other. Yes, I don't like some, but I like other kinds of pop music. So when we say that we should use any for interrogative and negative and some for affirmative, it's not always true. Like this example now, I can say I don't like some. So I don't like some pop music, but doesn't mean that I don't like any. So I don't like some and I don't like any, they would have different meanings. Uh, and if I say I like some and I like any, they have different meanings too. So, and how do we usually teach this to students? You were mentioning this to me. So how do we usually teach this to students? How do, do you or your books generally explain some and any? With examples, okay. All right, but what about the rules? What do we teach in, in terms of some or any? Perfect. So some affirmative, any for negative and questions. That is perfect. Uh, however, as we can see, there are many exceptions. Uh, also related to countable and uncountable, but then uh, de depending on, on what, yes, but usually it's uh, related to some when offering. Okay, what else? Okay, yes. Usually, usually the rule is some for affirmative, any for negatives. So, uh, Lewis from the English verb, this is the book where I got it from, he suggests something different. Of course, you cannot use this with any level uh, because you might confuse your students more than clarify. However, this explanation would be true for all cases, let's say. So some is used if the idea is restricted or limited. So I like some pop music. And is used if the idea is unrestricted or limited. And any applies to all unknown. Some applies to part. Okay, so both of them are. Uh, so if you think that any applies to all, so I like any pop music, it always applies to all. If I say I like some pop music, it applies to part, this would be like uh, an interesting rule for us to share. Of course, there are many uh, other cases, yeah? So if you wanted to, to think about a general idea, that could be a possibility, just to think about a general idea instead of giving so many rules, because many people are putting other rules here, like uh, someone requesting some when we are offering something, so when we are requesting or offering, any for negative, any for interrogative, if you're not re requesting or offering. So there are many rules. This one would be like a more global rule. Uh, and some and any will not have this relationship with countable and uncountable, as some people are asking, okay? Some, we usually talk about affirmative, any negative and interrogative, but then uh, like the example that somebody put there, would like some coffee, coffee is uncountable too, and we could use some with uh, with this, no problem. 
All right, so this is just another way for us to, to see grammar. Of course, you don't have to share this with your students, depending on their level, depending on how much they can, they can take as somebody wrote this. But we can think about, depending on what you're teaching, it will make more sense than teaching all the rules. If you're teaching them how to offer something, it makes sense to, to teach them some. Use some when you want to offer something. However, depending on what you're teaching, instead of saying that there are many exceptions, we can think about this approach. Okay. One more now. What about this one? Is it possible or not? All right, so it is, cor it is correct, it is possible. Uh, many people are saying that, especially nowadays. Uh, actually, in 1989, uh, Lou said that it was clever, subtle use, not a mistake, and then he, ga he gave some examples. Uh, nowadays, it's much more common for us to see because we're uh, trying to use neutral language, and then it's much more common. But it has always been possible. Instead of being seen as a mistake, it means that we don't want to uh, to, uh, to specify uh, the gender. So for example, if you think of this sentence, oh, look, there's somebody climbing out uh, of the wing of that building opposite. Oh, they have fallen. So they, because I don't know if it's a man or a woman or it's not important to mention the gender. So it's very, uh, very common for us instead of saying he, the, she, or he or she, because we don't know it's common to say they. Uh, exactly the example that Emilson put there. So like someone left their umbrella there. And then we can use there instead of his, dash, her, because we don't know or because we don't want to, uh, to mention the gender. So instead of he or she, instead of someone, uh, uh, instead of him, him or her, instead of uh, himself or uh, herself, we can use uh, they and all the variations. So this is something interesting that we could use. And then uh, when we think like who was on the phone, it was someone I met at the conference last week and they, so I'm not mentioning if it's he or she. So uh, this is something that is very common nowadays, and we definitely can use they instead of he or she, or instead of uh, he, dash, she, or something. So we can use they, their, them, and so on. OK? What about, oh, I have the answers for this one. <laughs> Uh, but explain me why. Why would the first one be incorrect, the second be correct, and the third one incorrect? So Eduardo uh, mentioned that uh, it lacks the time span in the first one. That's exactly why we cannot use would. Although uh, we want to say that this is something, 
that happened in the past that was kind of repetitive. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying I would play a lot when I was a child or something. So that's why the first one is incorrect. Uh, the second one is correct. I used to play a lot, but I don't play anymore. So second one is okay. What about the third one? Why can't we, we use would, would be? And why doesn't it work? <laughs> because it's a state, exactly. So we don't use would with state. So we don't use would with the verb to, uh, verb to be referring to a state. Like I would be thinner is not possible. So the correct one, I used to be thin. Not, not even, we don't, we won't use would with a, uh, because, exactly because of that, yes. Uh, these are not related to hypothetical, like second conditional, as some of you are mentioning. Uh, this is related to uh, the past. So we are, we are trying to refer, uh, like we are trying to talk about some actions that used to happen in the past. Uh, and then there is this idea of repetition. So they, they, they used to be repeated in the past. That's why you're using them. So it's not related to... Uh, second conditional. Uh, would that be possible is something totally different. So would that be possible is, uh, is, is okay, it's perfect. We cannot use would to refer to past, to refer to something that was repeated in the past. Okay, so we can use would with be. Uh, for example, I would be very very happy today if something happened. So when you're talking about a conditional, when you're talking about would that be possible, this is something okay. Uh, but then uh, we, we, we shouldn't use... Uh, the problem here is the state. So when you are thinking it's a state, this is the problem, this is the problem here. All right. So is it possible to tell a story in the past using the simple past? It's correct. Why is this correct? Why would we tell a story that happened in the past using the simple present? Yes. Why is it more vivid? Because it comes like uh, it gets like closer to the moment in which you're speaking. It is the historical present. Yes, exactly. We do that in, Port in Portuguese as well. Yes. So this is the reason why we can uh, tell this story using the simple present. It, it seems to be closer to us. Uh, exactly, you bring the past to the present and then people will be more engaged. So this is how we use, so sometimes we're talking about uh, the past time, but you're using the simple present. So this is something interesting for us to think. So we're talking about uh, something that happened in the past, but you're using a different uh, tense or a different form to express this. Yes, uh, context is everything, yes. And then uh, I will give you here an example from friends. So if you take a look, I'll give you some time to read this example from friends, please.
Yes, that's Chandler. <laughs> yes, they would, so who asked, who said that? I would ask you, yeah, who, who do you think had this, this dream? It was Chandler. So this is a scene from Friends in which he's describing a dream. And in order to make this his description more vivid, he's uh, using all verbs uh, in the present, not in the past. And then it makes like very uh, close and then we get very engaged. Uh, that's the reason why we could use the simple present to describe something that happened in the past. And then this one is about the tenses in English. There are only two, present and past. What about future? Is future a tense too? Yes, uh, so uh, we can use the present as future, yes. Uh, but if we think of the tenses in English, there are only two. They are the present and past. Uh, so a tense is never made by, use, by using auxiliary. So if we need to use, uh, if you need to, to use like will or going to, if you need to use have or something, they are not tenses in English. Tense, what is a tense in English? So the one that you're going to use, for example, he works, then you're going to put an S for he, she, it, you're going to put worked. E-G for, for the past. So those are the two only tenses. Uh, tense is something different from time, which many people, uh, so many people are writing about uh, using the future to, uh, using like will to express future, but then it's not a tense. So we have only two tenses, which are the present and the past. Uh, the future is something different. So let's take a look. There is this difference between tense and time. So if I say I speak Spanish very, I speak Spanish well, which is not true, by the way, <laughs> I don't. We are using speak, which is the present tense, and refers to general. It's not present time. I'm not talking about something right now. This is something more general. Exactly, it's a fact. So we are talking about present tense, but not present time. The second one, my birthday is on August 23rd. It is present tense because I, I'm using is, the verb to be. However, it's future time because August is just happening again next year. So future time. The third one, would you stop working if you won the lottery? This won is past tense, but it represents present or future time. Yes, this is a conditional, but then when you analyze only the one, it's past tense to represent present or future time. And the last one, have ever been to Bahamas means past time, but then I'm using the present perfect, so it's not a past tense. So this is something very important for us to see the difference. So when you're talking about future, some, oftentimes you're talking about future time, but there is no tense. Uh, of course, we need to analyze the context. And then we need to think of what is tense, in this case only present or past. So those are the only two po possibilities. And then when you think about time, is what we want to express. So many people wrote, some people wrote, oh, we can use the present simple to talk about the future. Like the second one, my birthday is on August 23rd. Uh, Christmas is around the corner or something like this. So we are expressing future, but we are talking about, uh, but we are using the present tense. So we can use different tenses to express different time. 
So it's very important to analyze the context, definitely. And then you get to know when to use one or the other. Exactly what Melissa said. So there are so many ways to express future. We can use, for example, <laughs> present to express future, like my example number two. We can use will, we can use going to, we can use uh, present continuous to express future too. So there are many ways uh, to express future. So uh, this is true. So we are expressing future time. But then one of the possibilities is to use uh, the simple present tense to do that. What about this one? So we agree that we use will to express future time, but is this the only possible use? What do you think? No. All right, so many other possibilities here. Uh, this one, for example, when we say water will boil at a temperature of 100 de uh, Celsius, uh, degrees Celsius. So uh, this one, for example, it's something that always happens. And we can use will. It's very common for us to use will to express something that uh, happens at a certain temperature. Uh, so. This is a common use of will. Another one here. What about the second one? What is that supposed to, to mean? Exactly. So when we want to express annoyance, something that the person refuses to do, uh, he will keep leaving the gate open, means, meaning that, OK, I've asked him to close the gate or something like this. So. This one uh, is very important for us to think that this one is not about the future. We are not expressing anything related to the future time. It means that he constantly does it. So uh, it expresses annoy annoyance. That's why I'm annoyed. That's why I'm using will. What about this third one? This is something that I believe it's true based on other facts. So I'm sure they will be here by now. It's something that uh, it's something that it's common for us to use will in the situation. It's exactly that. Yes, uh, we are talking about something that I've just like I I've come to the conclusion because of some other facts. Uh, so it's common for us to use will in this situation too. So will is used to express future time, but not always. Uh, we can use will in other situations like these three one, these three situations too. Somebody mentioned this, so I guess. What do you think? Some of you mentioned, oh, I need the context, I need the context.
All right. So if, uh, most people agree uh, that there is something that we expect and there is the context. Those are important too. I'll give you some examples. Uh, let's think of this exchange. Uh, if a person asks you, do you drink? And then you answer, no, thanks, I'm cool. What can you say about this exchange? Is it correct? Do you drink? No, thanks, I'm cool. It is an offer, yes. But when we want to offer something, we use do. Okay, so when we offer something, uh, we usually don't use do. Uh, we use do to talk about, like, if you like to drink, like, do you drink? But then do you drink what? Yes. So I'm asking if you drink or not. If I say, do you drink? I want to know if you drink possibly alcohol. That's why it's important the context and expectations that as uh, in the other slide. Because if somebody asks you, do you drink? Poss uh, possibly this person is talking about uh, drinking al alcohol. Uh, that's how we use this question. That's uh, the common question for somebody to ask you. But if you want to uh, offer, probably you're going to use another construction. So uh, what happens is the words are okay. Do you drink? This is fine. The form is okay too. The problem is the intention. What I want to have as an answer. Uh, this person here, uh, this is part. Uh, this is part of a movie. Yes, uh, uh, Thornbury gives this uh, this example. Uh, what happens is there is a guy who is going to to take his daughter uh, to a party or something like this. I think to the prom, and then the, par the the father is worried, so he asks, "Do you drink?" So he's not offering a drink. <laughs> <laughs> He's asking if the guy drinks. So it all depends on the context. It all depends on the intention that is associated with grammar. So this is what we call function in English. Uh, when Melissa says, oh, maybe there's a bottle and a glass. If there is a bottle and a, uh, and a glass and maybe the person offers using this way, you get to understand this. But now I'm sharing the context with you. It's a father who's asking uh the daughter's date who is going to take her like he's going to drive her to the prom so he doesn't want to offer any alcohol what he wants to know if is like if he drinks or not so the next uh sentence is uh do you think i would offer you alcohol <laughs> before you take my uh before you drive my daughter or something like this so that's why context is very important uh, but then, uh, having said that, we need to think of the intention that we, we want. So oftentimes our students, they are worried about choosing the correct words, uh, using the correct form, like, oh, here I'm using the auxiliary verb do to ask a question. So I remember, uh, I remember to use do when I went to ask a question and, and so on. So uh, the form is correct. But you don't want to ask the person if the person drinks. You want to ask something else. So in this case, we have to consider the function that is the, inten the intention associated with grammar. So you always have to think about function, not only form. Do you drink is the form? But then uh, somebody mentioned it's like, do you swim? <laughs> yes or no? Uh, you cannot accept anything from that. So the problem here is the function. So whenever we are teaching, we need to teach them when to use this, what kind of context this will be uh, appropriate to. It's not only about teaching them the correct form, but teaching the context too. What about this one here? I'd like you to read and tell me if it's correct, if it's appropriate, okay?
So what do you think? Is this appropriate? The first question was, is this correct? Yes. What is the context behind? A date. And then many people are writing now. It's really formal, but correct. So it's too formal when it comes like you are inviting a person to go out with you and then you, you use all those words. It, it is too formal. Okay. As Fernando mentioned that when we are teaching grammar, we need uh, we need to check where the challenge is. If it's like form, uh, register, or function, yes, basically speaking. I totally agree. What about this one? <laughs> Imagine a date in the 19th century, yes. Yes, but what is the context? If it's a WhatsApp message, it could be okay, but what is the context? The context is a job offer. So probably it wouldn't be appropriate like to answer to a job offer using WhatsApp and such informal language. So it's too informal for a job. The other was too formal for a date. And what do we call this in English? It is inappropriate, yes? What do we call this in English? Register, exactly. So even if the form correct function and register must be appropriate too. So uh, the intention associated with grammar must be there too. And register must be appropriate. We need to think of grammar and function. So grammar plus the intention and grammar and register. We need to check if it's too formal, if it's too informal, who are we talking to? Uh, and then if you think of writing an email, we need to teach if it should be formal or informal. Uh, depend so depending on the genre, of writing, for example, a WhatsApp message. We could teach our students uh, to write a message, for example. This is possible. And then if they're writing just a WhatsApp message, uh, depending on the context, depending on oh, I'm writing a WhatsApp message to my best friend. So it doesn't need to be formal. It should be quite informal. So it should be the opposite. But if you, if you write uh, a message, uh, responding to a job offer. It cannot be that informal. And then uh, it will depend on the words we use and how we use them and the genre of what we are teaching our students to decide if it's appropriate or not. So uh, it's very important for us to teach this too. Uh, there are many people who write in a very formal way and sometimes it can sound awkward. I don't know if you have ever met someone who really spoke in a very formal way, even if the conversation would be informal, uh, or the person wrote in a very formal way, even if like uh, the context would be informal. So those are not appropriate depending on what you're teaching your students. So this is something very important for us to consider. If we could, uh, if we are teaching these to our students too, uh, because form is not everything that should be taught. We need to, to teach them function and register. And guess what we usually teach them? We, we teach much more, like we teach them much more uh, things related to form uh, more often than function and register. But these need to be uh, taught too. So we needed to pay attention to those two. <laughs> uh, 
Melissa mentioned that uh, some people in Berlin write emails in English in a really formal way. Depending on uh, the context of those emails, if they're, for example, emails related to work, that would be fine. But if they're personal emails, then it gets awkward. So uh, this is something that we should we should really avoid. Um, a few years ago, I used to date a guy from Hungary. Uh, I met him here in Brazil, and we started a relationship here in Brazil. And we only spoke English, yeah, obviously. I didn't know how to speak his language, or he didn't know how to speak my language, so we spoke English all the time. And the first times I got his messages, I even showed them to Igor Cavalcant, the author from uh, English para Professor. Uh, I showed uh, this to him because uh, I said, oh, wow, what a city level. The, his English is perfect. I When I received his message, I thought, oh, what, like, it's very, very perfect. Like, very perfect, it doesn't exist. So it's perfect, like, perfect English, like, so uh, proficient. And I, I always shared these messages with Igor because they would be, like, city level. However, uh, then we started our relationship, we started getting closer to each other, and his messages continued being like uh, very formal, even after we, we had been dating for a while. And then I started getting tired of those messages because he didn't seem to be close to me because of his English. And then he went back to Hungary. We tried this long distance relationship for a while, but every time I got like his WhatsApp, I was like, oh, how boring. This guy's very boring. So I started feeling that he was a very boring person uh, because he was too formal when he was talking to me. It's just because he didn't know any other kind of English. Uh, somebody mentioned that in German, uh, emails are very formal. The only English he was like very formal. And guess what? I broke up with him <laughs> because of because of his register. So this is something that we should always teach students. Somebody mentioned teaching only form is a mistake. I totally agree. We should teach uh, ways that the students will be able to use the language. Yes, poor guy. Eh? But yes, I broke up with him <laughs> because of register. Then I thought, okay, it's not his fault. Eh? This is the only English he knows, but it's still, I couldn't get closer to him uh, because we seem to be like uh, somebody that I, he seemed to be somebody I didn't know. Uh, so this is something important and we should teach our students this too. So uh, we teach function, uh, we, uh, we teach form, sorry, which are, which are like the rules and everything. We teach how to use the language. Uh, so when do we use these and that? When do we use present perfect? How do we form the present perfect? This is fine. But then there are many other instances that we need to teach function, like the intention associated with grammar, and also register. It's true that we teach form more often because it's easier to explain. Those are the rules, as the grammar definition at the beginning of my session would say. Yes. Yeah? So, uh, those are the rules, so they're easier to explain. But the other things are also important. How to use is important. How to form is important. But we cannot forget about function and register. Is this possible in English? Yes, in English, it is possible. In Portuguese, it's not. Uh, word has it uh, that we received some telemarketing like booklets and they were translated from English. Uh, that's why people sometimes who work on telemarketing, they, they usually use the future continuous because the manuals, the booklets that uh, people would receive trainings with these booklets or with these manuals, they were uh, written in English using the future continuous. And then uh, 
when they were translated to Portuguese, they were translated like word by word, and then uh, it's being overused here. Uh, but it is it is possible. So this is definitely correct. What about this one here? It is wrong because uh, it's an indirect question. So do you know what time it is? But it's very common for our students and even for, for teachers to, to make this mistake. So this is something that we should be aware of, that we don't have like those double questions, like two questions in the same sentence. Just one will be, question, uh, will be the question. It is wrong. I don't know if it's common, but uh, it is wrong according uh, to grammar. It is wrong. It is incorrect too. So how can we study and improve grammar? We can have a blog. We can use social networks in English. We can read and write. We can reflect and take notes after your classes. But mainly, what can we do to improve? We can use some books to to help us. So those are just nine examples of some things that are very commonly like asked by students or mistakes that we teachers or students make very often. Uh, and by observing many lessons, I can see that we give more, uh, the, the focus is sometimes only on form, not on uh, functions, uh, function or register. So uh, those are things that we need to do. So uh, we can do all those things and we can also have some, uh, we can study grammar and be aware of grammar by having some of those books. Of course, you don't have to uh, buy them all <laughs> at once, but those books would help you a lot as teachers uh, because then you could like study grammar like more deeply and you could check the examples check other instances related to uh, functions, other instances related to register, and some things that we think that could be exceptions. They are not exceptions. There is like, uh, there is a why. So uh, we start getting to know the reasons. As I mentioned at the beginning of my session, not all always uh, really uh, we really uh, share with students things that we have learned while we are studying like awareness of the language. So I want to be more aware of the English language. I will not sh share those things with my students, then that's fine because they might be confused. It will depend on how much they can take. So usually we will not share half of the things or one third of the things we discovered. However, it's very important for us to know where to find information and to, uh, to study English, really, so that we are more prepared in case they ask us a question or in case they can, uh, they, they ask us or in case you want to review and revisit the way we explain things. So those are very interesting uh, books related to, uh, to language that I usually suggest to teachers. Uh, the name of the third one, is advanced grammar. I can send the uh, I can send the the name later. Yes, uh, actually, it's advanced language practice by Michael Vin Vinci. Okay, the the fourth one. So the fourth one is a very interesting one. Uh, it's not for teachers. It's usually for students. But the others uh, are usually books for teachers. My fav uh, one of my favorite ones are uh, about language by Thumbry. There is a new edition, so this picture is old, but it's a very interesting book for you to be aware of the language, really. And the other, all the other books that I mentioned here are very interesting too. English para a professor by Igor Cavalcante. I got some parts uh, of his book here. Uh, today. Uh, it's very interesting, it's in Portuguese, but it explains uh, how things are in English very well. So uh, it's published by Gisal. You could take a look at these, and all the others are very interesting. 
All right, so thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. I'll leave you with my email if you'd like to. So those are, are the books that I've used, as I mentioned. And if you'd like to send me any questions or comments, here's my email address. So thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you soon.